Good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started here in just one moment, so please keep hanging on. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Emergency Preparedness, Ombudsman Program Advocacy and Facility Responsibilities. My name is Amity Overall Labe. I'm the director of NORC, and we're so glad to have you on the line today. Just so you know, all lines are currently muted and will be throughout the presentation, but you can enter questions into the chat box in the panel on your screen, and we will take questions after all the presenters are done. We will also make sure to post the PowerPoint presentations and any handouts from the presenters on our website with the webinar recording, and we'll email that link out to you as well. Today, we are very, <clears throat> excuse me, very lucky to have with us today Louise Ryan, the Ombudsman Program Specialist with the Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging. Maria Green, she's a consultant here with us at NORC. Dania Vasquez, the Puerto Rico State Ombudsman. Lisa Hayes, the Managing Local Ombudsman from the Houston-Galveston Area Agency on Aging. And Mike Milliken, he's the Florida State Long-Term Care Ombudsman. So we are very lucky to have everyone here, here today. And you're first going to hear from Louise. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Louise. Uh, thank you, Amity, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, coming to this webinar. I think it's going to be uh, full of really useful information. And I especially appreciate our Ombudsman program experts who have lived through uh, emergency uh, disasters, uh, hurricanes, and similar floods, et cetera, and have that lived experience to share. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the view and the role of the Administration for Community Living, and I will get to that in a little bit. And so, so in the meantime, I want to turn it over to Maria to just kind of launch into the session. So, Maria? Hi, everyone. The overview for this afternoon's uh, webinar session will include emergency preparedness and response guidance. The Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services Emergency Preparedness Rule for Long-Term Care Facilities. And then we're going to have um, up-to-date information from Puerto Rico about their most recent experience and recovery post-Hurricane Maria. Uh, then from Texas, we'll hear about their experience that they've learned over the years and from that how to be better prepared. And then from Florida about their most recent experiences also in how their ombudsman uh, work to resolve issues post disasters. We'll talk about our emergency preparedness resources that are available through the National Ombudsman Resource Center. And then we hope to have time and we plan to for questions and responses. Next slide. I would be remiss if I didn't give everyone a reminder that emergency preparedness is very personal. So you yourself or yourself and your family need to have a plan for all types of emergencies. You need to practice that plan, communicate the plan with your family and others who might get notified that you're um, either safe or missing. ICE stands for in case of emergency contact. So those would be the people that you would want to have available both in written documentation and in your phone and other locations that you would contact in an emergency. And then you need supplies. You see some listed there, and then most recently I found this um, picture of a Crisco can, which I've never thought about this, but if you're without electricity, you can stick a string down in a can of Crisco and light it and have a source of light for a little bit. 
Next slide. <clears throat> also, the discussion is most important today around emergency preparedness for residents of long-term care facilities. So when we think about what residents should know about emergency preparedness, we would want them to know the basics of the emergency plan there at the home that they live to the best of their ability and understanding. Residents should be involved and participate in the plan. Um, I love the examples where the leadership of a facility and the first responders gather together and do an evacuation where the residents actually get to meet the first responders. It's good for residents themselves to have a to-go bag where they might put their most important items that they want to take with them. And then also the residents, the facility, and others need to have current in case of emergency contacts for each of the residents so that during, before, during, or afterwards, they can keep family and loved ones informed of where they might be either sheltering or uh, transferring to another facility. Next slide. So you may remember that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services came out with some new rules and regulations for emergency preparedness for those facilities that uh, are licensed and accept Medicaid and Medicare. And their final rule was implemented November the 15th, 2017. So I just chose some highlights. This is by um, not at all the whole list of requirements, but just some of the ones I thought you would be interested in, that the facility needs to update their emergency plan annually. Um, they need to include requirements for subsistence needs and temperature control. Um, subsistence needs is enough fuel to go several weeks, food, uh, medication, for instance, uh, temperature, we most recently heard of uh, cases where there was not adequate heating or cooling in facilities after post-disasters, and the, if they had a generator, it didn't um, heat or cool adequately the entire facility. They should have an updated communication plan. They should have a training plan. One should be community-based. That was kind of the example where I said the first responders, the law enforcement, the sheriff, the firemen, and um, EMTs and others would come and participate with the residents in doing a full-scale practice plan. And they can also do one tabletop exercise. Tabletop exercise is where all those people involved in emergency management and the leadership of the facility sit down at a table together and do a mock pretend uh, pending disaster, how it will be handled and how they will respond to it. And facilities should have emergency standby power system. The next slide is going to tell us a little bit more about that. So in their frequently answer, answers and questions, frequently asked questions document that you can also find available on their website. Uh, the latest update was in June of 2017 about the operations of air conditioning and heating systems. What it says in their rule is that they must maintain temperatures to protect the residents' health and safety. Safe and storage, stay, safe and sanitary storage of provisions. Now, they don't go so far as to recommend what type of alternate energy source a facility has to have on hand, but they then say if a generator is used, then it must have the capacity to run the heating and cooling system. And they do specify that a generator is required for facilities where the resident uses life supporting equipment. Okay, next slide. So in the CMS, uh, rules and regulations, and also as a part of that, they have the emergency preparedness checklist, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen before. If not, it's downloadable from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And this is something that they want all of the state agencies that 
or involved in emergency management to use. And I want you to know that the long-term care ombudsman program is referenced several times. It is uh, strongly recommending that a member of the ombudsman program be a part of the state emergency planning committee that when the clearinghouse, it's like a resident tracking document, when that is produced, that it be shared with the long-term care ombudsman. So it's not that the ombudsman are required to do the clearinghouse document, but that it be shared with you so that you know where residents have been relocated to after a disaster. And then it gives responsibility both for the state survey agency and the ombudsman program staff to contact all the healthcare facilities, to determine their status, um, see if there's you know, any assistance that they need, if they're without power, utilities, et cetera. They do make the exception that if you, the ombudsman, are in the impacted area or the mandatory evacuation area, then you might not would be able to do this step. You might could still if you could use your telephone, but um, as far as making a site visit, if you've been asked to evacuate, you should follow the evacuation orders. The next slide is about demonstration for community living's emergency preparedness ombudsman model policies and procedures, and I will ask Louise to pick up from here and share a little bit more about the model. Great, thank you, Maria. Um, before I talk about the uh, model um, policies and procedures, I did want to just spend a, a minute on kind of what ACL does during. Um, uh, national disasters, like for instance, right now we've got uh, Hurricane Florence and the states that are affected there. Um, and so um, ACL is not a, a direct emergency response uh, agency, but we do coordinate with other health and human services divisions, such as the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, um, is a big one, and also within that other federal agencies such as FEMA to, to kind of support the state agencies, the state units on aging as they work to make sure that older adults and persons with disabilities um, receive the services and supports that they need during, before, during, and after these uh, disasters. Uh, we also work closely within um, the Administration for Community Living, we have the um, Protection and Advocacy agency, Agencies and the Centers for Independent Living, so we have both kind of aging and disability cross-coordination with these agency, uh, other federal agencies. So um, basically, during this time when there is a, a, a disaster, uh, there is regular communication going on with you know, within federal agencies to coordinate response. And last year, during um, Hurricane Maria and oh, I'm forgetting the other hurricane, they were so close together. Um, we also, our agency actually had staff who went to the affected area. One staff person went down to Florida to help in the response, uh, you know, after the disaster. Um, and we've also had another person did what we call a detail. She came from her regional office to Washington, D.C. to make sure the voice of uh, older adults and persons with disabilities was um, there at the table and, and that there's their needs and the services and supports that they need were um, recognized and addressed. So that's kind of the role that ACL has. Um, Turning to the Ombudsman Program Model Policies and Procedures, go ahead to the next slide. Um, there's a couple things to know, kind of how it came about, and it came about um, after Hurricane Katrina, where, as you know, during Katrina, there were nursing home, uh, people who lived in nursing homes who were, uh, there were serious problems, as you know, with, in terms of deaths and lack of appropriate um, planning and response. So the Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General did some research on kind of nursing homes and their capacity 
and they also looked at the long-term care ombudsman program. And one of their findings was that there was not consistent guidance to ombudsman programs on their role with regards to emergency preparation and response. And their recommendation was that ACL draft model policies and procedures that states can use. Now, we do want to recognize that um, there is not a direct mandate to um, provide emergency response and um, and prepar you know that emergency preparation and response it's not directly in uh, spelled out in the Older Americans Act for Ombudsman programs, um, and we understand that there's not additional funding for that. Um, however, you know you are called upon to uh, promote and protect the health, safety, welfare, and rights of residents. So clearly. Uh, responding to and preparing for uh, disasters, you know, is certainly fair game in terms of the work that you do. So just a few things I want to mention um, in general, uh, and that Maria mentioned this early on, and I'll just say it again, it's important that you personally are prepared for emergencies, you and your family. And then within that, that your local, if you have local ombudsman entities, that they have emergency contingency plans and that you coordinate that as a state ombudsman that you coordinate either with your local entities or your staff how you respond and prepare for emergencies um, and that's the whole point of this policy and procedure um, so the policy and procedure really describes things like what should the state and local ombudsman programs do? How do they coordinate and communicate with others? Um, how do they provide services? And, you know, especially say, how do you have contingency plans if a disaster affects one part of the state? How do you help to get coverage when that one part of the state is kind of out of service for a while? Um, what about training? How do you educate residents and families? And how do you provide information um, to facility staff? So the policies and procedures are intended to be kind of a grab and go that you can take and just start to use. So for instance, it describes what should be included in a training. Um, it has a, kind of a list of items that you should kind of have with you, uh, what you should have in a go kit in your car or vehicle. Um, it also has things like, um, for instance, ombudsman program information, a list of things that you should have printed in hard, both have electronic and hard copy related to your program. So basically, if you start to implement these policies, you will, you know, it, you will have a, a guide to help you figure it out. And that's what this does. It kind of spells it all out. Um, next slide. So as with um, everything related to the Ombudsman program, um, we always want to look at it from the resident-centered perspective and we also as the ombudsman programs not only look at it at the individual resident level but also as their systems responses that you want to look at too in terms of representing the interests of residents and with that systems level response how do you coordinate and communicate in terms of emergency preparation and response and so for instance, an example of kind of that systems level coordination work would be um, things like participating in healthcare coalitions that are typically led by public health uh, departments or other kind of emergency preparedness coalitions. So that would be kind of an example of at a systems level, what do you do kind of ongoing? And again, those kinds of ideas are listed out in this model policy and procedure, um, both at kind of what does the state ombudsman do, what do local entities or local uh, representatives of the office do. 
Um, so that's how it works. I would also say it, it also goes into detail on how do you handle complaints during an emergency, and it's got some helpful guidance there. And again, how you handle complaints is not different than your typical way of responding to complaints, but you have to factor in this disaster, you know, and what does that mean? And so again, uh, you know, issues that may come up specific to if a resident had to evacuate or they are sheltering in place or anything like that, um, are, those kind of factors are addressed in the policy and procedure. Um, next slide. And again, I've mentioned this, but I do want to say it again in terms of your role. Um, again, you, your role, you know, obviously is to provide services to help residents to protect and promote their health, safety, welfare, and rights. And again, thinking of the system's advocacy to represent the interest of residents before governmental agencies. Um, so again, it's not, there's not a direct mandate around, specifically around emergency preparation and response, but there is this general global requirement. Um, and so we hope, I hope that the policies and procedures, if you've not looked at that, that you would take a look at it and see how that could be helpful to you in your state and work on implementing it. There's a lot of good resources on the Ombudsman Resource Center website that um, can help to kind of further your work on this. Um, and I think, we are no one is immune from these types of disasters. I mean, when I was state ombudsman, I you know lived through a couple big storms, and um, you know where you had a million of us without power, and that's really tough. And so, how do you make sure residents are safe in those situations? As as much as you're able to do that in coordination with first responders. Um, again, I probably didn't say this. Uh, seven times, but imagine that I said it seven times. The Ombudsman program is not a first responder program, but you do have a role to complement and support those first responders. And with that, I will turn it back to Maria. Thanks, Louise. Hi. Thanks, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, oh, this is go right in there, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, very well said. Thanks, Louise, for summarizing that about the role of the Ombudsman Program and disaster preparedness. So next, we're going to switch to hear from personal experiences from state and local programs that have experienced disasters. Uh, first, we're going to start with Dania. Hi. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dania Vasquez, and I am the Salem Tenker Ombudsman of Puerto Rico. And I will be talking about the recovery process after Hurricane Maria. Next slide. As all you know, Hurricane Maria, uh, Category 4, entered the island on September 20, 2016, at 6.15 a.m. Maria outperformed Hurricane Hugo in 1989. Although it was a Category 4 hurricane like George's, in 1998, its winds were stronger. It, it crossed the entire island with sustained winds of 155 miles per hour. She rode over Puerto Rico and forced 11,229 people to seek asylum in 158 emergency shelters. It was stronger than Katrina. Next slide. This was the official Hurricane Maria trajectory. Next slide. Let's see what the impact of Hurricane Maria was. 
This statistic were obtained by the media and the George Washington University study 2018. As you see, 2,975 deaths, damages or destroyed home was 472,000. 11,229 was the people in shelters. 100% without electricity. 92% of the fallen communication towers and 60% of people without water. This number was uh, the number of deaths. I would like to say the, the number was a controversy due to the multiple situation that faces the hurricane, and that was in the media. Some public health problems due to Hurricane Maria was the leptospirosis due to the water contaminated with rolling urine, high levels of fungi in the environment, greater spread of diseases by the mosquito as a vector like influenza, dengue, and others. Next slide. Action taken by the Department of, of Health. Health education programs aimed at the population of the island, like use drug repellent, clean hands before and after eating, the importance of filtered water, and clean food. Next slide. It was evidence during the hurricane that the elderly were among the most affected groups. For 2016, it was estimated that the elderly population would be 855,708, representing 25% of the population. In the fiscal year 2017, the total number of Residents of long, in long-term care facilities was 16,964 residents, 2% of the total of population of elderly. Next slide. The number of long-term care facilities versus the number of residents, the orange part represents the amount of the long-term care residents, 16,964. The blue part represents the amount of long-term care facilities being 834. Next slide. Our plan of action was call before calls were made before and after the arrival of hurricanes Irma and Maria. Check that long-term care facilities and households have an adequate operational emergency plan and activate it. Make visits to the long-term care facilities and communities of the elderly to identify their needs as the hurricane rest at the hurricane. Refer to government agencies and private services provider. Notice and information about the hurricane season was sent with the disaster emergency management information form to long-term care and communities. A training section for, the all, for all long-term care facilities administration was coordinated to revise emergency plans and learn New strategies, new strategies for effective response to disaster, such as third community emergency response team. Next slide. Share long-term care inventory information with regulatory agency. Collaborated in organizing and, and delivering food, water, and other materials. 
the state unit director and a special assistant working in the tax force with FEMA, HHS, Health Department, Police, and Justice Department in effort to reach all long term care facilities and distribute assistance. Participation in radio program to offer information and assistance. Senior tax group to discover lessons learned. Next slide. As you see, that is the geographic location of the A local program in Puerto Rico. Next slide. The detecting needs were divided in five variables drinking water, fuel, food, hygiene items, and first necessity items. As you can see, the gas was the first one with 54%, the water with 52%, food with 90%, hygiene items with 48%. The necessities with 42%, and some long term care no report any needs with 17%. Next slide. Actions taken by the state. Legislation to regulate the licensing and supervision of the establishment for the care of elderly people where in long-term care facilities will be required to possess systems and generators. The state and the office provide a review of the operational emergency plan, training to community and long-term care providers in community emergency response teams, agreement with the private entities such as churches, to incorporate them in emergency management, implement the emergency operations center, create an elderly tax force group composed by different agents. Next slide. The result. The resources with the greatest demand were fuel, drinking water, and hygiene items. Only the 17% reported that they don't need resources, that they already have everything. This will be this being long-term care facilities mostly in the metro area, especially in the municipalities of Bayamón, San Juan, the capital, and Guaynabo. Next slide. Our conclusion, it was observed that the, in long-term care facilities, the most demand was the fuel, especially diesel, because after a few weeks without electricity, long-term care facilities needed to be energized. As we know, the long-term care depends on machines that absorb a lot, a lot of electricity to keep fragile adults stable. Of the 17% long-term care facilities that did not report needing supplies, the majority was in the metro area, indicated that in this region, there was a greater response from the state emergency agencies and greater preparation in the long term care facilities. And the last slide, for reference, the last slide is about other studies that focuses on the elderly population and natural disaster. Thank you for your attention, and that is all. Thank you so much, Sonia. All right, next we have Lisa Hayes. Go ahead, Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Hayes, and um, I'm with the Houston Galveston Area Agency on Aging. And of course, last year we had Harvey. Um, and some people might think that there's not a lot for ombudsman to do in a natural disaster since care plans, call lights, and freedom of choice becomes less immediate dangers. But there's actually a lot of advocacy for ombudsman to do in such an event or as hurricane, tornado, blizzard, wildfire seasons approach. Um, as uh, Danya noted in her slide, you know, research in 2012 showed that 
um, a lot of the evacuating actually puts a lot of the residents at risk. So um, some of the facilities might choose to shelter in place also because of the risk as well as the cost. And so beforehand in emergency preparedness, you know, ombudsmen need to really ask a lot of questions to advocate for residents to make sure that these plans are not only good on paper, but they're actually practical for where that facility is located. Uh, next slide. So of course, you know, the strength of ombudsmen during a natural disaster is that um, we often live in the community that we serve, especially our volunteers. Um, most of our volunteers, you know, live very close by to the facilities that they volunteer at. Um, also because our staff is broken up into areas for most states that we also live in that area. And as evacuations are being announced, they're usually done by neighborhoods um, and through local news. So sometimes we might find out about them. And usually when an event is going on, um, such as Harvey, um, the operations um, went to the Capitol and they were being run from the state. So regulatory, was um, closed their local offices and everything was being run from Austin. Um, so as they would announce evacuations, we would sometimes get calls to our programs, the programs that were affected, and they'd be asking us, you know, what, where is that? Where is Wood Forest? And we would know which facilities were in that area. Also, we have relationships with residents and families. Chances are we have their cell phone numbers of a resident or family member. And chances are they have ours from, you know, working with them on cases and on other issues. Um, luckily for our program, we do have work cells. Um, we also make regular visits. So facilities have high turnover of leadership. I know in Texas, the average stay of an administrator is six months. Um, so that's not very often that you know regulatory would have that kind of information such as their personal cell numbers and we often have that also from working cases with them um, also the role that we have we are not investigators or surveyors and some facilities are more willing to talk with ombudsman during time of crisis they kind of begin to associate us with you know being people who brainstorm and help problem solve so um, Next slide. So of course we have a very important role in helping them prepare. Um, one of the first steps that we did um, in preparing for Harvey was coordinate with the state long-term care ombudsman office to find out point persons for um, person for each of the programs to relay facility updates. And then the state long-term care ombudsman office gave those updates to the regulatory command. And this helped keep down any kind of chaos because obviously um, the information was coming quick and furious um, as they would be releasing uh, retention um, lakes and releasing levees, um, that information would change quite quickly. Um, and what we had in our programs is the uh, volunteers and staff would relay the information to the managing local ombudsman, and then we would then relay it up to this point person at the state long-term care ombudsman office. Um, determine who from each program will call into the healthcare coalitions led by local emergency management groups. Um, during Harvey, these calls, um, the facilities did not speak pretty much at all, um, but the emergency management operations gave out some very good information. Um, I don't feel like most of the facilities wanted to speak on the calls because they don't want to air their dirty laundry during um, to their competition um, on these calls, but it did give a lot of really good information. Uh, prepare a list of staff and volunteer cell numbers and alternate numbers and note who is staying or evacuating. Um, again, as Maria and um, Louis spoke about is very important as we are ombudsmen are people who care and take care of other people that we remember to take care of ourselves. Um, but it's also important for us to know, you know, who will be where and as an event is unfolding, um, who you might be need to be concerned about as far as your staff and volunteers. 
Um, also, ask volunteers and staff to submit a list of contacts for each facility, cell numbers of administrator and other facility leadership, resident council president and other residents, as well as the family council president. And then as information unfolds, whether it be from CMS or from emergency operations, we can help relay that information. Um, and also one thing that we've also learned is to have backup cell um, power packs. So that's an important thing to include um, in your emergency preparedness because most people now just work on cell phones. But also if towers go down um, and landlines aren't working, you only need a split second for text messages to go through. Um, next slide. No. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Um, another step to do um, before the event occurs, if there is such time, is contact facilities to find out if they plan to evacuate and if so, where. Um, you may have to do this multiple times. Um, for those of us who live in hurricane states, you know, the hurricanes are constantly changing their paths. Um, I know those with fires, fires pop up and move elsewhere. Um, so a lot of times this, this needs to be a constantly changing list. Um, if facilities are choosing to shelter in place, um, first find out if it's a mandatory evacuation. We did have some facilities that were in mandatory evacuation areas that chose to shelter in place. And the state was requiring that if the local law enforcement gave the okay for it, they were going to allow them to stay. Um, if they're involuntary um, and they're um, choosing to shelter in place, make sure that they have notified their local emergency operations management. Um, for high risk residents, um, especially vent and dialysis residents, um, you know, ask them if they're being sent to the hospital. Uh, quite often when there's a disaster area, CMS has a waiver where you don't have to have the, the two midnights in a hospital to go to a, a skilled nursing facility. They often also will allow residents to be admitted to um, hospitals um, during such events so that they can be taken care of. Um, ask them again, do they have enough supplies, food, medicine, emergency evacuation vests? and fuel for backup power. Um, our state provides these evacuation vests that they can put on residents where they can seal in their medical records, they can put in their medication and their contact information, and it's a vest that goes over and is secured onto their torso, and that's provided free to assisted livings and nursing homes. I don't know if all states have that, but it's pretty nice that Texas does provide that. Um, other supplies to also ask them about is other things such as flashlights, sandbags. Of course, there's also briefs and wipes, but most importantly, staff. What we had happen in several of um, our facilities is that staff was quite low during the emergency. And we actually had two assisted livings in Texas where the staff completely abandoned the residents. Um, so they need to make sure that they definitely have enough staff. Um, and also as far as the to-go bags is also talking to the residents and the facilities and making sure that the residents um, know exactly what they want to take as far as if they do have to evacuate in the emergency. We also ask them how many available beds that they have and we create this list of available beds and this is to help as kind of the when the everything hits the fan stage of the emergency. And we submit, gave this list to our state long-term care ombudsman and they also gave it to regulatories command. And as facilities during the event need to find places that maybe were not part of their plan, um, at least they know what beds are available that they might be able to get to. Um, our state long-term care ombudsman office also asked um, programs that were nearby our program to also give those bed lists um, that were what was available um, so that 
could be added. So there was ones in San Antonio and other areas that some of the facilities went to. Uh, we also let the facility leadership know that we were creating this list. And so many of them did contact us during Harvey to get a copy of that list. Um, also ask what their plan B or plan C is if they must leave. Um, most facilities have a plan for evacuating well in advance of, an, of a disaster. They also have a plan for sheltering in place, but most of them do not have a plan for when everything hits the fan and sheltering in place is no, no longer working. Um, and that's where we really saw most of the problems during Harvey is facilities that were sheltering in place. And then when they couldn't get their contracted ambulances to come because those contracts are only usually good pre an emergency, um, how were they going to get the residents out? Um, and then where were they going to go? Because obviously going to another facility owned by their corporation was not an option. Um, so talking through with them um, about what is a good plan. Again, most of our administrators and leadership, there's high turnover and some of, the, some of them may not be familiar with the area. Um, such as in Texas, our highways are built to flood. And so many of their plans were to go through the highways, which were no longer passable. Obviously that was not a practical plan. Um, for flooding, um, this is something that's also become um, kind of an, a new issue um, is volunteer rescues. And the Cajun Navy was quite big during um, Harvey. And the Cajun Navy is just a name for basically any volunteer with a boat. It's not organized. So facilities need to have a plan if there is volunteer rescues to ensure that the residents all go to the same shelter, that they all have their necessary medications and equipment, um, and that possibly if they can to have staff go with them um, to make sure that the residents are accounted for and that everybody knows where they go. Because again, this is unorganized volunteers. So it's important that they do think of some kind of policy. We actually had one of our facilities in Friendswood and or they were rescued by volunteers <clears throat> and um, there was a little bit of chaos in that. As a result, um, one of the volunteers who did show up was the city council member. So their city council has voted not to let that facility re, um, uh, basically rehab and reopen. Uh, because they thought that the owners did a very poor job in emergency planning. Next slide. And of course, um, is also informing the nursing homes and assisted livings to watch for CMS um, waivers, such as the three-day hospital stay for Medicare for coverage to go to skilled nursing. This really helped out some, a lot of our assisted livings that needed to evacuate and many of them, such as the one that made the news, La Vida Bella, um, if all of y'all remember the picture of the, the ladies in wheelchairs um, in three feet of water, that facility did send their residents um, to nursing homes and most of them stayed in the nursing homes for several months um, as they were trying to find out where to go next. But making sure that facilities are aware of these kind of waivers as CMS begins to announce them. Okay, and that's it. Next slide. Thank you, Lisa. Great reminder about the waivers and a lot of other excellent tips. Really appreciate that. So next we have Mike from Florida. Go ahead, Mike. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Milliken. I'm a state long-term care home by the state of Florida. Uh, with the advent of several storms over the past decade, Florida has undertaken a comprehensive rewrite of the emergency management required for assisted living facilities. Yeah. People folks have talked a lot about nursing homes, but I'm going to mainly focus just on the assisted living. Well, hurricanes gather mostly attention in Florida. Florida requires that their facilities take all hazards 
to emergency management. A building fire, a water main breakage, or a new power outages are all emergency. And facilities are required to develop plans to mitigate the uh, effects of all uncontrollable emergencies. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, these are the components of the emergency preparedness plan that Florida has developed. Of course, it has to have a provision for all hazards, provisions for the care of residents remaining in the facility during an emergency, including pre-disaster or the emergency preparation for whatever's coming, protecting the facility, the supplies, the emergency power, food, water, staffing, and emergency equipment. This is all pre-storm preparation. Provision for the care of residents who must be evacuated from the facility during an emergency, including the identification of such residents and the transfer of residents' records, evacuation, transportation, sheltering arrangements, supply staffing, emergency equipment, and medications. And remember, all of this has to be in a plan. This is all the planning steps. Next slide. Okay. Provisions for the care of additional residents who may be evacuated to the facility during an emergency, including the identification of such residents, staffing, and supplies. In Florida, facilities may accept residents from other facilities for up to 15 days without um, violating any statutes for their occupancy. Uh, when they do take in the extra residents, they have to make sure they have enough supplies, food, water, and staffing to care for those additional residents that they take in. Identification of residents of Alzheimer's disease or related disorders and residents with mobility limitations who may need specialized assistance either at the facility or in case of evacuation. A lot of times what will happen is folks uh, who need uh, advanced medical care who are in ALS may need to go to a shelter that has uh, larger generation power um, that can run all the machinery necessary for their care. Identification of the coordination with the local emergency management agency. Next slide. Next slide. Just, hi Mike. Can you speak a little closer to the microphone? It's a little hard to hear you occasionally. Thank you. Okay. Arrangement for post-disaster activities that after the storm has come, including responding to family inquiries, obtaining medical interventions for residents, transportation and reporting to the local emergency management agency the number of residents who have been relocated in the place of relocation. This is all addressed in the emergency plan of how they're going to interact with the residents, with the family members once the storm has passed. The identification of each staff responsible for implementing each part of the plan. There are many components in each plan. Who is going to be responsible for which part? Who's going to be responsible for preparing the residents for transportation who need to uh, go to the, a nursing home or who prepares the residents who need to go to the hospital or who is assisting the residents who are going to be staying. Next slide. Okay. All staff must be trained in their duties and are responsible for implementing the emergency management plan. We also have a new emergency power rule and in that particular rule, every staff member has to know, for the assisted living, has to know how to be able to demonstrate the operation of the generator. So all staff have to be trained in all of their duties and are required to actually perform those duties once the emergency plan is implemented. If telephone service is not available during the emergency, the facility must request assistance from local law enforcement or emergency management personnel in maintaining communications. In, in the major storms, you'll see that the uh, cell towers go down and the landlines go down. That's when they have to get in contact with uh, emergency management center and their local law enforcement. Next slide. Okay. Facilities must evacuate the premises during or after an emergency if so directed by the local emergency management agency. That is not a choice. That's what they must do. Uh, we have 67 counties in Florida. Each county has an emergency operations uh, center. Uh, the facilities communicate with that center. If that center says they have to leave, then they must leave. 
The facility must report the evacuation to the local office of emergency management or designee and to the agency for health care administration, which is the regulatory agency for uh, long-term care facilities, within six hours of the evacuation order. If the evacuation takes more than six hours, the facility must report when the evacuation is completed. Um, in the larger uh, assisted living that have 200 beds or so, it may take them more than six hours to evacuate. The facility must not be reoccupied until the area is declared clear for reentry by the local emergency management agency or its designee, and the facility can meet the immediate needs of the residents. So just because the emergency management people say you can go back, if you don't have the food, the water, and the medications for your residents to return, then you can't return. Next slide. A facility with significant structural damage must relocate until the facility can be safely reoccupied. And of course, that's going to take um, all the building management people to come in to say that the building is now safe to be reoccupied. The facility is responsible for knowing the location of all residents until the residents have been relocated to another facility. And the facility must provide the agency with the name of a contact person who must be available 24 hours a day uh, by telephone. Next slide. Okay. The facility must assist in the relocation of residents and must cooperate with outreach teams established by the Department of Health and Emergency Management Agency to assist in this relocation. And this is going to happen most times when there's a mandatory evacuation. If it's voluntary, the facilities already have uh, memorandums of understanding with other facilities to take them in. This basically is when they're told they have to go and they don't have any place to send them. Residents' needs and preferences must be considered to the extent possible in any relocation decision. Of course, when you have to go, you have to go, and the needs and wants of the residents can be taken into consideration, but sometimes it's where can we go. Next slide. Okay. For the emergency plan, this plan is approved by the local county Emergency Management Agency is not approved by the state. If their plan requires revisions to the emergency management plan, such revisions must be made and the plan must be submitted to the local office within 30 days of receiving notification that the plan had to be revised. Any new facility as described in the rule, the facilities who have transferred their ownership must submit an emergency plan within 30 days after obtaining a license. Next slide. Uh, the facility must review its emergency management plan on an annual basis. That means every year they have to review this. If there's a substantive change, that change must be submitted to the Emergency Operations Center for that county and then approved again. Lessons learned. Uh, we've had a number of hurricanes here and we've learned a number of lessons. Uh, these are just a few of them. One of the things that we ran into a lot throughout the state uh, especially with Irma, was curfews. Many towns and cities instituted curfews uh, for their residents. A lot of times it was um, dust to gone. And this really impacted the caregivers who worked different shifts, 7 to 11, 11 to 7, uh, 7 to 3, where sometimes they would have to travel uh, during the evening hours to get to their facility. And many uh, reported being stopped by their local law enforcement uh, while trying to get to their facility. So that's one of the things that we've been uh, trying to address with um, the county emergency operations centers. And I know the uh, regulatory agency also has this in mind. We want to make sure that all caregivers um, are able to get to the facility um, for their shift and also to return to their homes once their shift is over. Um, second item is telephone numbers. I know this kind of seems a little odd, but we made 1,900 calls um, within the first day. And of those 1,900 calls, we on first try, we were only able to reach 1,100 facilities because we got answers like the number is no longer in service, uh, the mailbox is full, uh, it's the wrong number. Uh, this is not that person's phone anymore. 
So what we've done this year is um, on our annual assessment forms we will be visiting facilities with, we are actually going to ask for a very specific phone number for the person who is going to be responsible for communicating uh, with state agencies and families so that when we pull up the facility, we have a number that we can call and we know that we're going to reach the correct person. We're also asking them if they can give us at that point in time, what is their relocation location? We understand that, especially with Irma, first we thought it was gonna come up the East Coast, uh, then we thought it was gonna come up the middle of the state, then we thought it was gonna come up the West Coast, and as it happens, it went up all three. So facilities on the East Coast evacuated to the West Coast, and then when it headed to the West Coast, facilities on the West Coast wanted to evacuate to the East Coast, but there was nobody there. So plans do change, and we understand that. But the first thing we want to do is we at least want to have a starting point of a facility. This is where they plan to go, where we can call that facility and they say, no, they didn't come here. They went to X, Y, Z facility. So uh, we have an idea of where the residents are located so we can make contact. And it's not just contact for us. We received a number of calls from family members who could not uh, find their loved ones. So we also want to be able to inform them of where their loved one is. Uh, staffing was another issue uh, that we ran into. Uh, we did have some reports of uh, third-party service providers uh, not being able to either get to the facility or not wanting to come to the facility uh, because their staff had evacuated. So there, there are some issues there that we have to resolve. Uh, we haven't come up with you know, a, a response that would fit all the needs yet, uh, but it is something that we're looking into. Uh, the fourth one is, is access, and that's access to facilities, access to supplies. Uh, I mean, they had tanker trucks coming in with police escorts just to get them into the state to bring fuel in. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a big thing where everybody was running out of fuel to fuel their generators, and not just for long-term care facilities, but for everyone. And the last one was supplies. This is a big... Uh, point of interest for the emergency uh, plans now. Um, in the past, um, the plans have been reviewed as long as they had uh, a source of supplies, uh, the plan was okay. Now a lot of the counties are looking at to see exactly how many people or how many facilities say that they're going to get, be getting their supplies from any certain supplier. For instance, if you had five facilities that were all getting their water from ABC Water, and you knew that ABC Water was not that big of a company, and they would not be able to provide all five facilities with all the water that they needed, then the Emergency Operations Center would send that plan back and tell the facilities, no, you have to choose a different source because they are not going to be able to provide you with what you need in that time. So we, we learned a lot of things. I'm sure there are a lot of things um, that are still coming out that will come to our attention. The, the biggest thing is that we are identifying issues and we are trying to get those issues fixed. Um, we, we had a phenomenal response from our volunteers um, throughout the state. So um, I'm open to any questions. Great, thank you so much, Mike. All right, so you're open to questions. That's good timing because we are at the part of our webinar where we're going to do some Q&A. So if you'll give me one second, I'll check our questions and we'll get started. Um, several of you asked if the PowerPoint slides are going to be available. So just as a reminder, yes, the webinar recording, PDF of the slides, and any other handouts will be provided after the webinar and we'll include a link in the follow-up email after this webinar as well. One question um, was if the agency or facility, I guess, is a Medicaid certified facility, do they have to follow the, the emergency preparedness requirements that were discussed earlier in the webinar? If you can put your line on mute if you're not speaking. Um, Maria, I didn't know if you wanted to take a stab at that question, and if not, then I can, I can respond as well. 
and I can repeat the question. So the short answer, so the question was, do the facility to accept Medicaid, if I understood it correctly, the facility to accept Medicaid, um, especially the skilled nursing facilities, if they have to meet the requirements of the final rules and regulations that were implemented in June of 2017? And the short answer is uh, yes. As always, I think that frequently asked questions document is very telling. The number of questions that came in, and um, some of them you can see by the dates probably what events were happening that were causing them to ask the question. But there were a lot of questions about that alternative source, like a generator or cisterns or things that would, you know, provide the energy, collect the water, that sort of thing. So um, those FAQs tell us a lot about the questions that they're asking about the compliance with this, but yes, they're supposed to comply. Thanks, Maria. And just to um, add a little bit more to that, the rule applies to 17 specific provider and supplier types uh, that receive Medicaid. So for example, uh, hospitals, obviously nursing facilities, um, even hospices, transplant centers, et cetera. So um, as Maria said, uh, definitely review the FAQs. There's a lot of information directly linked from our emergency preparedness page. But to be clear, that does not include, you know, assisted living facilities. Um, so anything, Louise, did you want to add anything to that? Feel free. And if you're speaking, Louise, you're on mute. So just to unmute if you are speaking. Yes, I had my phone unmuted, but not computer. Yes, so any <laughs> Medicare, okay. Medicaid contractor, and I think Amity covered it well, think of home health agencies, anything like that, but not, uh, not facilities that are licensed or certified through your state, like assisted living or residential care, or foster homes, those would come under state requirements. Thank you, Louise. So another question that came in, what does a facility do in the event that they have a resident who refuses to leave in an evacuation? Anyone can uh, respond to that, especially if you've had that experience. I guess I would, I would wonder if what the question I would maybe pose back to them was, what is your plan? Um, as everybody else leaves, how are you going to manage? So maybe even just kind of bringing it down to the real, you know, how are you going to get through the day? Just um, people might say, I'm not going to leave. But when you start talking to them about meal prep and power and et cetera, it might be, you know, then they rethink it. And then it's like, well, if you don't want to go wherever, where everyone else is going, where do you want to go? Are there some places that, you know, you might be able to get to? Those are just a couple off the top thoughts. Thanks, Louise. Anyone have anything else to add to that? Okay. Um, thanks, Robin. I got your reminder, and, and you're absolutely right, and I wanted to bring this up as well. Um, just so you all know, and we're not going to go into a lot of detail about this right now, but CMS is currently proposing to change <laughs> the very rule that we're talking about, about emergency preparedness. Um, for example, the emergency plan would need to be reviewed and updated every two years instead of annually. So uh, just wanted to give you a heads up that that's going on right now as well, and there will be more information forthcoming. Thank you, Robin. Appreciate that. So another question that just came in, um, is there, and, and these are definitely, this is a great question for the states, uh, Mike and Dania and Lisa, is there an on-site ombudsman presence in the facilities during evacuations or post-disaster? Have you all had could you speak to that based on your experience, what that looks like, if possible? This is Mike. This is Lisa. Go ahead, Lisa. 
This is Lisa. We did not, um, again, safety of our ombudsman, and we didn't want them out on the streets. Um, so really, it was more by telephone and um, was how we mainly communicated. Uh, this is Mike. Uh, we mostly communicated by telephone. We did send some folks out to uh, some facilities. However, uh, the governor did mandate that uh, the local law enforcement agencies throughout the state must visit um, each facility. So the facilities were visited at least by law enforcement. A number of them were visited by the regulatory agency. Uh, I know that we visited some. Uh, one of the big things that we got with complaints of facilities was they were getting too many calls, too many visits. Um, so, so they definitely were visited. Thanks, Mike. Um, and that's a good point you brought up about facilities getting too many calls and potentially even too many visits. I believe it was back in uh, Lisa's presentation and, and as well in both yours and Dania's about identifying a point person um, and making sure that locally and statewide there's some kind of process um, in order to not have multiple people calling the same facility and asking the same questions because in the middle of a disaster that's certainly not not what's needed um, okay so if you could put your lines back on mute if you're not speaking that would be great another question and i was actually curious about this as well um, when I believe it was Lisa mentioned the assisted living staff that completely abandoned their residence. I was very, I wanted to hear more about that and what happened. So here's the question that ties into that. What's the experience of today's presenters about facility staff walking off the job, either to tend to their own families or they simply just um, don't care or don't report for work if they, maybe they can't even get there um, during the emergency? Um, have, have you had that experience? Uh, what happened in those situations? Um, anything you could share related to that would be great. I think that's happened at pretty much a lot, most of our facilities and that, you know, that people obviously are going to want to take care of themselves. It's also a question of, um, of being able to get there, such as when there's flooding um, or they may not have reliable transportation, or some of them might use public transportation, which is shut down. Um, so that is an issue. And so that's why I think it's really important when speaking to the um, leadership to make sure that leadership will be there. Um, because I think that's really important in making sure that, you know, staff stays, the staff that is able to come in, um, and, you know, the leadership will have, probably have to be doing actual care. Uh, thanks, Maria, Lisa. I would also suggest that it be a part of the plan, the emergency plan that the facility has, how they're going to do staffing. For instance, I've seen some plans where they allow staff to bring their families and even animals to the facility if they will continue to stay there and work. That's a great point, Maria. And and perhaps even in those situations where they can bring their families and or pets, being in the facility may even be safer for them than in their own home, depending on you know access to resources and what it looks like. Um, I, I, did I cut someone off else, someone else that was gonna to respond to that? Hey, Amy, I was just gonna say that we didn't have a lot of reports of people refusing to come to work. Um, the majority of our reports were again, the issues with uh, you know, down power lines or blocked roads where people just couldn't get to work, um, where the staff that was on duty had to stay just because their release just wouldn't get there. Exactly. Good point, Mike. And, and back to Lisa's point as well, can't get there and, and maybe even relying on public transportation that can't get there as well in addition to the down power lines and the flooding. Good point. Thank you. Um, um, another quick question, someone asked out of curiosity if, if any of you have experienced situations when residents did actually refuse to evacuate. Um, and maybe another question to, that ties into that would be, have you experienced facilities that refuse to evacuate even if they were under mandatory evacuation orders? This is Lisa, and we did have um, two facilities in Matagorda County that 
their corporate office made the decision not to evacuate. And uh, another program in Texas, um, which they're still doing the criminal investigation on, um, where the corporate office and the administrator refused to evacuate, even though there was several feet of water in the facility and the volunteer rescues had showed up. Um, and basically, when we called regulatory, when the two facilities in Matagorda County were refusing to evacuate, they basically stated that as long as law enforcement was not forcing them to leave, they were going to let them shelter in place. Thanks, Lisa. And, and that, that calls back the importance of, of coordinating and communicating with the larger either statewide or local task forces that involve law enforcement as well. That's part of this entire disaster preparedness coordination. Thank you. Good point. Anyone else wanted to respond to that? Okay. Well, those that covers actually all the questions, unless there's another one that comes in. Um, anything that our presenters, anything else you wanted to share before we last minute comments that came up as others were speaking or just anything else you wanted to share before we move on to resources and close out? Uh, Andy, I just want to say that uh, Florida does have a system. Uh, it's called Florida Health Staff. We're moving to a new, new system called ESS, where post-emergency, during the emergency, the facilities uh, log into this log into this system by themselves. They can tell us what their status is. They can see if they got power, what their needs are, how many beds they have available in case somebody needs to evacuate. So we depend a lot on the facilities to report that information in, but that's information that all the facilities can get back. So if they do have to evacuate, they know who has beds available um, and who doesn't. And the emergency operations center and the regulatory agency and us, we can find out what facilities are in need of, you know, what supplies or, you know, we were, we were trying to stay here, but now we're going to have to leave. So we, we can get all that information real time as the facilities report back. That's great, Mike. Very helpful to have that. Anyone else have something they want to share? Um, this is Louise. Uh, just uh, thank you to all the presenters. They all provided such great and kind of hands-on experiences. And I think just to, uh, serves as a good reminder of how important that coordination is, both within the Ombudsman program and with your external partners, including law enforcement. Um, so I, I just think that was uh, um, just some really great practical tips and experiences. And thank you all for that, um, for sharing. Thanks, Louise. Yes, I completely agree. These are all really important lessons learned and tips that will be valuable that, for everyone because as was mentioned in the presentations, um, disasters strike everywhere. It just depends on where you live, what type they are, and you definitely need to be prepared. And unfortunately, we'll probably have some more lessons learned um, from states that are dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Florence right now. So this is gonna be an ongoing uh, topic for sure. So to close out, I just wanted to uh, call your attention to our emergency preparedness web page. We have an entire issue page devoted specifically to this topic. There um, are numerous materials for specifically for ombudsman programs, including an entire toolkit that includes uh, tips for how to prepare yourself personally, you and your family, as well as how to prepare yourself professionally to do your work as an ombudsman before, during, and after a disaster strikes. Um, there's also information on that web page that you can share with consumers. And, and one of those, I have an image right here of a consumer fact sheet about emergency preparedness. It'd be really helpful to, to engage residents and get them and their families involved in asking questions of the facilities about their plans 
And as was mentioned by the presenters, not just their plan A, what's their plan B and C as well? Because as we know, um, things need to be very fluid. It could be that their um, transportation plans are also booked by several other nursing homes. Um, they have the exact same transportation company and then they're at capacity or something like that. So asking the important questions and first residents and their families need to know what kind of ask, uh, questions to ask. So that consumer fact sheet is very helpful. So please visit that issue page and um, pull out those resources. We also include the model policies and procedures that Louise reviewed. Thank you for uh, reviewing those, Louise. And, and like she said, they really are just ready for programs to pick up and use uh, statewide. So um, take a look at those if you haven't already among your state programs. <clears throat> and last but not least, here's uh, contact information for our presenters. And if you have any questions, you can feel free, of course, to reach out to the center. You can contact me directly or um, contact our Ombud Center at the consumervoice.org website. And we will make sure to send out an email following this to everyone that registered with a link to where the materials are posted. And right after the webinar closes, there will be an evaluation of today's presentation. It'll only take a few minutes, so we'd really appreciate any feedback that you have, because it really helps us improve our presentations for the future. So thank you, Maria. Thank you, Louise. Thanks, Dania, Lisa, and Mike. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you all for joining the uh, call today and for the advocacy and the work that you do every day for long-term care residents. So that's all we have for you today. Take care and let us know if you need anything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amity. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.